So good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's my honor to be here again. I was there, I think, two or three years ago. So it's always very impressive to be in such a big room with so many people. Uh, and I must admit that I'm probably one of the person being guilty for this title this year about the future of sourcing, whether our job's gonna disappear in the next five to 10 years. Uh, for those who know me, I've been in Hong Kong for quite a long time, for over 23 years, and I came here in 1994 for sourcing already. Prior to that, I was a buyer, so I went into sourcing in 1994, and for the past 23 years, I must say that I've been watching changes in the industry, but one thing that uh, kind of annoys me a little bit is to see how slow we have been uh, to adapt to the new world. And I was interested to hear Thibault talking about what's happening in e-commerce. Actually, my first job was in the catalog business, which in a way is the ancestor of e-commerce because the problematic of e-commerce is very much similar to catalog long time back. But I think the biggest challenge when we see what's happening on the retail and, and the e-com landscape and what we see, uh, what are the expectations of the consumer today is how slow we in manufacturing have been able to adapt. And I think we are now the weak point of the supply chain to address the changes and the need of the consumer. So I'm going to walk you through today uh, a story of Puma. I worked for Puma for the past five years. Prior to that, I was with Lien Fung for many years. So I was a middleman. Um, and, and when I joined Puma five years ago, for those who are into the sports business, Puma was nowhere, okay? It was a dying brand. Um, if you would have asked ask my kids five years ago whether they would buy and wear Puma, nobody wanted, even if I was given that for them for free. So it was pretty difficult five years ago. Yes. And, and what I, the journey we went through at Puma for the past five years is, is you know, being a dying brand, going back into a, a more agile and a more uh, up-to-date brand and how collaboration has been critical for us to, tr to do the transformation. So, sorry, this is, can you give, a, I need the other one, yeah, okay. So in 2013, there was no brand heat, no range quality, declining sales, very clear. We were really, really nowhere. And, and there was a big change of, um, of leadership at Puma. The, the board changed. There was a new CEO on board. For those who know, we are part of the Caring Group, which is a major luxury, uh, luxury group uh, today. And you know, we, the roadmap was very clear. We had to fix product process people. Okay, So we had to jump from the 90s. I wouldn't say not to the 20, 13 years, but at least to 2005, 2005 because we were really, really behind. So that was the mandate I, I was given on the sourcing side, is really to work on that. And we had a global and, and very innovative competition next to us. When I joined in 2012, Nike was 15 billion. Today, they are 30 billion. Adidas was 14 billion. They announced they're reaching the 20 billion uh, two days ago. Under Armour didn't exist. 20 years ago, they are a 4 billion company today. So there is a lot of activity happening on the sports industry, and on the top of it, not even mentioning all the e-commerce platforms that were a new competition for us. So, you know, a, a kind of very behind company in a very fast and innovative competition, a lot of uh, challenges to uh, address. The road to recovery was very clear. Uh, we had to go through and we defined actually three main pillars for us to address. The first one was the co-creation, the second one, the co-management, and what I call also the co-training as the third pillar. So briefly, I'm going to go through that, uh, three different pillars that we went through. The co-creation for us was critical. When you are a small brand, and Puma today is, is close to four billion, so it's you know, very far behind Nike and, and Adidas, the first issue for us was to understand the environment. We didn't really know who was the consumer, and we really didn't know what our key accounts were needed to get from us. So it's all start, I understand, by the consumer, but if you don't have the right product, you have no consumer. So product remains really key. We had a very complex, unpredictable business environment. You know, all of you know, also recently, we have now a lot of trade agreements, big questions coming through the pipeline with our new president in the US. So we have to be flexible and, and allow fast response. The consumer demands open and transparent supply chain. 
it's not even negotiable today not to be transparent the way you provide your goods to the consumer. There has been in these conferences a lot of topics discussed about sustainability. My view is that sustainability is not negotiable anymore. And that triggers a lot of decisions how you organize your sourcing uh, for your product. The other element which is very clear for me is that the chase after the cheap labor and how uh, you know, the low FOBs chase, this has delayed us to invest into technology. How many of you in the room get the mandate from headquarters somewhere in Europe or in the US to chase for the next cheap factory? So I've been watching people moving from China to Bangladesh, now Myanmar is on the red screen, for what? For a cheaper CM cost that represent a very small portion of your retail price. And this chase of low FOBs and very cheap labor has delayed us to really tackle the real issue which is investment into efficiencies and technology. So what we, what we did going through that, um, you know, the, this understanding of the environment is how can we partner with our suppliers to really act as one, one team for one dream? I think I said it two years ago, but, but the way in the apparel business for Puma we operate, we have 10 partners globally that supply 65% of our product, 10 only. And if I take the top 20, it's 85%. So we have tried to rationalize on an extreme level how few suppliers or partners we have to help us to deliver product to the consumer. And this went through a lot of investments into technology from our partners, but also investment from our side into technology, mentioning about 3D, uh, um, 3D sampling, which has become something critical. If you look at the change, I love this picture. It was provided by one of my directors. If you look in 1900 and you try to find the automobile that's in New York, Fifth Avenue, in 1900, it was all cars were managed by, by horses, actually. If you go, so there is one car here. If you go 13 years later in 1913, there was no horses anymore. It took only 13 years in the beginning of the 20th centuries to move from horses to cars. This is the same revolution, and Thibault mentioned about that, this is the same revolution we're going through. And again, our industry has been very, very slow in embracing the change. Our manufacturers have been very slow in embracing the change, and we are now really the weak point, the weak, weak part of, uh, of the whole supply chain. So we did this co-creation project uh, by setting up the new rules and get ready to fight. There is a lot of fight out there. We moved the development from headquarters completely. The development at Puma is under sourcing, so which is a very big asset for me and my team because we don't have to get people somewhere in the headquarter, either in Germany or in the US, to tell us what to do. We own the development. We own the responsibility of margin. We own the, the responsibility of supply allocation. So what I did about three years ago, I actually cut half of the jobs in Germany and moved them in Asia, because what is critical as an industry is for us to understand the product. Too many people in our business have no engineering background. They come from different business schools or different type of study. They don't even know how a product is being made. And if you have them seated 10,000 kilometers away, far away from the real actors who are the manufacturers, they don't know what they don't know. And you need to bring them really in closer to the factory. So we have now moved at source a lot of the development. We have development centers in the premises of our suppliers, which brings clarity, focus, and discipline, but also the collaboration with the vendors make the product better and definitely also much more competitive in terms of cost. Because what we do now, we design to value, by simplifying the way we organize design, we bring designers in the factory for two to three weeks as well to collaborate and work directly with the factory. They are on the, on the factory floor, they are on the sewing floor, and they see how the product is being made, finding ways to make it production friendly and more competitive, but also faster to produce. And we have started to digitalize the sampling process. This is not an easy task, uh, there are resistance primarily from the design team, because the way they operate has to change. 
and there are not so many people. This is a new job, a new competence. Finding people able to digitalize sampling is a challenge today. And then we have identified our strategic partners. Some are in China, some are in Bangladesh, some are in Mexico. It's global. What we try is to learn from them and, and have this innovation journey together. So just to show you one of the award product uh, that we had recently at ISPO, which is a big fair in Munich, um, this has been a product co-designed together with the manufacturers and the design team. The co-management, uh, what you're trying to do is to engage in a collaborative dialogue for mutual benefit, not just us, but the supplier. We need our suppliers to make money. They need to make money because if they don't make money, they cannot invest. We need them to be confident that we are there with them for long term. So we do strategic planning with them, committing for three to four years, so they have the visibility which is necessary for them to invest in automation and technology. So we have worked with the suppliers. We outsource to them part of, of responsibilities. I was recently visiting a very large group in China, in Dongwon, and they uh, work a lot with Uniglo. Now Uniglo uh, planning team is sitting at the supplier and will decide on a daily basis, depending on the sales, what production needs to go first or how can they change the planning, the manufacturing organization, depending on what they sell at what time. We are actually have started to have uh, the similar initiative. The right first time is critical. Uh, too many cases, you have product coming in and out and being remade. We work a lot at the very beginning of the chain with the suppliers to make sure that what we're going to put into production together is right. And again, this is a collaboration process between the one having the knowledge on the factory floor and the people from the design and product who's going to sell it. And we commit for long term. On the global sales, because that's the other part, I think in our, in our world, the two key pillars are, to me, manufacturing, sourcing, and sales. So Puma is 80% a wool cell driven company, which is the case for most of the sports uh, brands. We work very closely with the global sales. Each country has key accounts, key distributors that they deal with, you know, such as Intersport in Europe or Foot Locker in the US. We work very, very closely with these guys to plan. We need better forecast because if you don't have the right forecast, you cannot plan production accordingly and you cannot have the right inventory. So we've been connecting a lot with the guy from sales to get that data. It's always about how do you manage your big data to be shared with the suppliers. And whenever we had to, we localize sourcing. Um, you know, with the trade agreement situation, and it's something we're not, not really new, actually it's new in the US, but Argentina, for instance, had borders being closed for quite many years. So in the global brand such as Puma, we have localized a lot of sourcing whenever it was needed. We do India for India, Argentina for Argentina. We do uh, Brazil for Brazil, Mexico for Mexico. So we have this possibility to look at the picture globally, and the localization is also critical. And then the co-training, because you cannot achieve anything if you don't train your people accordingly. One of the biggest challenges I face when we went through that journey is to get the right mindset. People in our industry have been resisting to change. And I love this picture, you know, Puma is very engaged into the motorsport industry. We have four key partners, BMW, uh, Mercedes, Red Bull, and Ferrari. And I love this picture. I mean, today, you know, to win a race, you have to have a team able to change the tires in a very, very, very speedy manner. And today it takes 2.7 seconds to change the four tires on a car during a race. So, and the, and the, and the one doing the fastest is actually BMW. So if you don't have the right mindset, and if not everybody have the same thinking that our product is your product, we are in it together, then it doesn't work. And changing the mindset has been, to me, the biggest challenge. So the biggest problematic we had was how to move a sourcing organization from a very traditional executing role, which has been the case in Asia forever, to a much more collaborative model. Make our people understand that they have a say. They have a veto right if they spot something that they believe will not be efficient, if they believe it's going to really create hurdles along the way. And changing that has been very, uh, 
to me, very challenging. So the first element or the first uh, um, step that we took was to get our people to get to know the product. I'm sure if you make a survey within your teams and you ask them how much they know about how your product is being manufactured in a factory, most of them have no clue. They have been acting as postman for a long time, and I think the first step in the recovery or transformation is to bring back this engineering knowledge. At the end of the day, you know, if you look at the product from the fashion industry, on the factory level, and we have some of the manufacturers in the room, and I'm sure they will, they will say the same as I'm going to say, but you have so many steps in doing a product. If your people don't understand that, there is no way you can change the dynamic. Learn from the experts. So we put in place a program with our key uh, partners to send our people in the factory for a week or two so they can learn from every step, from the yarn knitting to the yarn dyeing to the yarn printing to the uh, CM to the sewing to the logistic. What is it exactly that we do? Without that knowledge, there is no transformation. We have uh, also engaged our people for continuous learning and make clear that it's right to fail, it's right to make mistakes, and they have to try again and again and again. So we have strategic suppliers helping us. We put in in-house academy program in place, and we're now looking at partnering with local universities in certain countries of the world where the talent is being so rare that we have to train them from the very beginning. So the outcome for 2016, in 2015 we grew by 5%, 2016 we just announced the results a few weeks ago, we grew by 10%, the operating income has grew by 33%, which is a good recovery, not good enough because the competition is also acting very fast. But at the end of the day, you know, we felt that the repositioning of the brand has started to pay off. 2017 is going to be again a double G growth. Certain countries like China are over 25 to 30% growth, and we see the momentum once you start building up the right collaboration platform, how much of that can translate into increasing your sales has been for us, for the moment, a quite good result. So more fun to come, and maybe I come back in two years and I tell you what's happening at Puma by 2019. Thank you very much.